changes that is making it uh, uh, more business rescue friendly and is also making it uh, more data friendly than the um, framework that I uh, just immediately described. And um, the introductions are mainly the fact that two procedures were introduced. One is the company voluntary arrangement, which as the name suggests, is a voluntary um, uh, initiative for restructuring uh, between the company and uh, its creditors. And um, it's uh, a process that is basically um, done in the shadow of the court. Uh, it's really some, uh, some level of engagement between the company and, um, and its creditors supported by an insolvency or restructuring practitioner. And then the second one is a more formal and court-driven uh, uh, process, although it has different ways in which it can be commenced, which is uh, the process of administration. Uh, so in, in the main, um, th that's, those are the uh, major insolvency framework. Now, in terms of the insolvency uh, practice itself, the new law also creates a framework for regulation of the practice of insolvency and restructuring. Uh, in a nutshell, that, that, that can uh, be the best way to um, summarize uh, the changes introduced by Kama 2020. Now, Bolanle, um, would you like to add, in, in view of what Okori has just said about the overview of the main changes, would you, can, I, can I get a take from you on that as well? Well, thank you, sir. Well, yes, um, Okori has outlined the major uh, changes that have been introduced by the Act, but it's also imperative that we mention um, you know, some of the adjustments that were made by Kama 2020 uh, on the uh, existing systems that were in place under uh, the previous Kama regime. Um, so yes, we had those new provisions that were introduced, but we also had um, an arrangement and compromise procedure that many people dealing with banks uh, in the 2004-2005 era would be familiar with. Uh, what has happened with the arrangement and compromise procedure is that we have uh, now a new moratorium, which is a stay on hostile actions by creditors of the company uh, that has been introduced uh, into Kama 2020. And it means that when a company is going through the quite court-driven arrangements and compromise procedure, they would find that they have, at least in principle, the benefit of the protection that this stay on actions uh, provides for them. We also have uh, some existing, um, other existing procedures that have been adjusted. So if you looked at the liquidation regime, for example, uh, you would find that uh, towards the end of th those procedures, the law talks about unwinding previous transactions uh, that have been entered into by the company in the lead up to the liquidation of the company. And you will find that the provisions on um, fraudulent preferences, for example, has been adjusted with a new provision provision or a new set of provisions on transactions that undervalue. Now, this might be quite technical insolvency terms, but uh, they're quite easy to get to speed with. So a fraudulent preference is what happens when a creditor is given an advantage, an undue advantage that they might not have had if the company had gone immediately into liquidation. So for example, you pay them off because you know that the company is going insolvent and you don't want them to suffer that fit. A transaction at undervalue is also uh, to protect particular people uh, by giving them uh, either a gift of the company's assets or selling to entering into, a, uh, into an agreement with them where the company gets little or no consideration of value for that which the company has uh, given to them. You also have quite a few provisions that have been put in place to assist the delivery of corporate rescue, which Okori has talked about quite extensively. And so you have provisions dealing with access to finance. You have provisions dealing with uh, um, the relationship between the company and its critical suppliers. Uh, there's quite a number of those additional bits and pieces uh, littered across the act that would be necessary for those engaged in insolvency to get up to speed with so that they can deal with the system and the company quite holistically. Uh, thank you, Bolanle. 
Now, Okori, I'll, I'll ask you this question. Um, what, what, what are the implications of these changes for the nature of the insolvency system, in your view? Thank you very much. Uh, first, to mention that um, one of the um, greatest challenge that we would be having <laughs> is the fact that we can we can discuss all this uh, within one hour, and uh, um, so I, I am being careful because of time for us not to to ramble on. Because, like uh, Bolanle mentioned, there are quite technical issues, and we want to just have um, the audience have a sense of how relevant. Um, these these issues are in terms of what it portends for the economy. Now that dovetails into the uh, question you've asked in terms of the implication for uh, these changes. Um, as everybody has mentioned uh, at the onset of the uh, of this um, um, meeting, um, the economy is obviously the lifeblood uh, for for the country, and uh, and. Um, it is paramount to, to find uh, means and, and provide systems that are going to assist the economy to survive. Of course, that, that's the whole essence of um, government and regulation when you have you know, the financial sector, the capital market sector. The insolvency sector itself as well is one of those um, um, tripod in the economy system that actually uh, ensures that uh, not just at the level of the, the um, enterprise units, which are the corporate vehicles that are used, but also at a national level, you are, you are able to um, achieve um, growth and restructuring where the, the businesses are failing and so on and so forth. And so in terms of um, the changes for us as a country, these are huge. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, um, it, it appeared that there were little or no um, um, restructuring or insolvent rescue uh, options available uh, under the, the old corporate law that we had. And so it created a lot of pressure uh, on the government and on the practitioners, particularly those that were quite exposed and were already quite um, um, involved in terms of trying to promote a uh, business rescue. Now a framework is created that would help in terms of um, a paradigm shift uh, in, the, in the mind of the different stakeholders uh, uh, when it comes to a company. Whether you are talking about those that are the owners of the business or the managers of the business or those that are providing credits to the business uh, or, or supplies uh, like uh, Bonali mentioned, and uh, so many things uh, that, that um, are involved around the companies uh, being used as um, you know vehicle for, for, for generating wealth. So it's, it's huge uh, for us. Thank you, Okori. Bolanli, would you like to add to that? Yes, um, I would also say that, yes, uh, Okori has talked about the most fundamental I think there's a challenge with uh, Bonlanley's uh, uh, microphone. We can't hear you, Bonlanley. Would you be kind enough to repeat yourself, please? Yes, I will. Uh, the host muted me. Um, yes, Okori has given the uh, fundamental change, the, the, the implications of the fundamental change. But it's also important to know that one of the, one of the goals of the new law is to strike a balance between the interests of the various stakeholders that are engaged in the rescue of a business. And so you would see that uh, while some additional powers and additional avenues to advocate for the company have been provided to those in charge of the companies, like the directors and its senior officers, the law at the same time still protects the interests of the secured creditors. And you would find that while um, unsecured creditors who were usually in the past disenfranchised or left out in the cold, they didn't have a say in receivership, for example, and uh, barely anyone would turn to them in an arrangement or compromise, you would find that the new provisions like administration and the company voluntary arrangement uh, require the insolvency practitioner 
to engage with the unsecured creditors of the company so that they have a say in what is going on. But the law puts in checks and balances to ensure that no single stakeholder group uh, completely dominates the other. The smaller groups or, or the ones with less power cannot hold uh, those with more power to ransom, but uh, the ones with more power can also not uh, simply remove uh, those that have less power from the conversation at all. And so you see a system of checks and balances, sticks and carrots that permeate across the insolvency system, which I think works best to the interest of all those that are engaged in the company and ensure that uh, we can deliver the necessary procedures that enable us rescue companies that are struggling within a defined period of time. Thank you, Bolan Le. Thank you, Okori. In addition to Kama 2020, are there any, any other laws that um, affect insolvency? Thank you very much. Yes, they are. Um, well, um, it's, it's important to mention um, from the onset that uh, Kama is the go-to general framework. Uh, for insolvency, corporate insolvency to be specific. Uh, in terms of personal insolvency, um, we have the Bankruptcy Act uh, um, in Nigeria. Now it's a, an old law uh, and it's still the extant law. There have been uh, attempts to um, reform this law. Um, however, either by reason of the fact that um, it was not properly thought out, um, uh, and it had several issues. Um, it was not assented to it by law, uh, by the president. Uh, and so um, we remain with an old and more archaic uh, bankruptcy act, which um, suffers the same type of issues that uh, the Kama 1990 um, had, which is the fact that uh, it does not balance the, the right of the stakeholders properly and it's not business um, rescue oriented is quite punitive to be to be uh, to be very honest and so uh, in 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 real terms in practical terms is is more observed in breach or in disuse than uh, 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 being actually uh, utilized uh, by practitioners and we've had uh, interesting experiences as practitioners when it comes to the use of bankruptcy uh, procedures uh, you know to go after debtors, uh, you will find out that even judges are quite reluctant to take the very stringent uh, approach of the Bankruptcy Act. Then you do have a uh, sector-based um, insol special insolvency uh, regimes. Uh, in the banking sector, you've had um, um, it's, um, you know, scattered in a, a few legislation like um, uh, the NDIC Act uh, and uh, the um, that's the Nigerian Deposit Insurance Corporation Act, as well as the Asset Management uh, uh, Corporation of Nigeria Act. Um, and then of course you have the BOFIA uh, that also just creates a framework, uh, a regulatory framework that is for, for you know, rescue of, uh, of banks and financial institution. But to the extent that um, it, it leads to restructuring, it is connected to insolvency and restructuring. In the capital market, um, you had some um, um, attempt also as creating a special regime um, in terms of what is called um, segregation of assets of uh, capital market operators vis-a-vis uh, -vis the assets of um, uh, investors uh, or the portfolio of investors so that when the capital market operators um, become insolvent, um, these assets are not commingled and it leads to um, some form of injustice, uh, so to speak, to um, this particularly protected set of investors. You also have a few other, uh, you know, uh, legislations uh, in the insurance sector and a couple of other sectors, but really they are special regimes. And so that can always um, continue. And uh, in the capital market sector that I mentioned, you also have um, um, the issue of netting. Uh, that is a special um, insolvency issue that um, a tool that is used to also um, impact on what we call a ranking of claims when it comes to claims in an insolvency. 
So those are, uh, in a nutshell, some of the um, aspect of, um, you know, legal sources of insolvency. Bolanle, I'm sure you want to add to that. Well, uh, Okari has uh, given you basically what the framework is. I would say primarily for corporate insolvency, you also would um, look at, of course, the insolvency regulations, which were referenced by the president of the LCCI at the start. And you have the winding up rules as well, which uh, would parties would need to pay attention to during uh, both during winding up and other provisions or other procedures. Well, one law that is not really a, it's not an insolvency law, but is most important for those in this space would be the Corporate Governance Act. And that's because insolvency law is the tail end of corporate governance. Insolvency is what happens when governance goes wrong. And so for us, it is important that the directors of the company bear in mind that the liabilities that uh, fall upon them at the time when the company becomes insolvent will be tracked back to the governance acts that they took while they were in charge of the company. And so it's important as well that the directors uh, take into consideration what their governance responsibilities are, and that would help them avoid uh, the slide into insolvency. That would, uh, I think, basically sum up uh, what the legal framework in this area is. Now, Bolanle, before you answer this one, I'd like you to just take 30 seconds and, 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 and be very frank about this. Would you say that the Nigerian legal framework on insolvency is now complete and robust enough? Well, I was going to come here to, to, uh, to talk very nicely about the Nigerian insolvency system, but I think I'm going to take my cue from uh, the president when he gave his remarks at the very start well, I could see that he was being quite frank with us. And so I think it behoves me as an invitee to follow my host here. Well, I would say that we have made some progress. Uh, as Okori has mentioned, we have introduced a corporate, rescue, a, a corporate rescue framework, and it has some of the fundamental nuts and bolts of what uh, we, we need. We've gone from a hostile framework to one that uh, is more interested. So when we keep saying rescue, uh, we mean that one that is interested in the preservation of the business at the very least, because it is the business that contributes to the economy. So the company is the one that employs uh, uh, people and is likely to fall uh, into liquidation if there's a problem. But we are really interested in viable businesses. And so at least the insolvency system promotes a rescue of the business. We'd be grateful if, it would, if the practitioners like Okori and yourself would work towards uh, saving the company uh, itself as well. Well, we've made key changes in accountability. That was an area that was seriously lacking in the past, people only knew when a company went into receivership, for example, uh, the company could remain in receivership almost in perpetuity. And that was a fundamental problem for most people. And you would find that people would defend their companies even to the point of death. We have had some of those instances in Nigeria to, in order to prevent a receiver from taking control of their, of their, of their, of their businesses. And so now you find that uh, with the accountability provisions for insolvency office holders, as well as for company office holders, as well as the introduction of um, efficiency standards, that's your time delimited provisions, you'd find that the system has the fundamentals that it needs. But in terms of whether that is robust enough or that is complete, well, I would simply say for me, uh, my answer is no. We still need, for example, to build the regulatory framework for practitioners. Practitioners, you see, are at the very heart of the system that has been introduced. And so uh, oversight of the practitioners and ensuring that we have robust systems in place where people who are dissatisfied with what the practitioners do can 
report and those practitioners would be disciplined would send a very strong message to the market. That area still needs um, adjustment. You also need uh, adjustment to the way that our system works. So you'd find that what happens in the federal high courts, the state high courts might say that they don't countenance what is going on there. Therefore, you'd find a practitioner trying to rescue a company through the federal high court that has oversight of or exclusive jurisdiction over karma issues, but the state high court dealing with what they say is uh, debt recovery. Now, when a company is in an insolvency is in an insolvency framework, the entirety of everything that has to do with that company should actually go into one central court that administers what it is that should be done with that company. And so, I think we need to clarify the relationship between the various parts the various moving parts of our insolvency system. Um, Okori can tell us more. I think you would have to jump in on this, on the court system and the pace at which things work. But um, I think for me, those are the core, some of the core challenges that I find. Uh, Okori. Yes, please, Okori. Um, yes, thank you, Doc. Um, thank you, Mr. Samotu. Um, the reality is that um, um, I think I'll summarize it by saying that um, we are doing well, but there is room for improvement. Uh, that, that would just be the summary. And I agree with um, uh, the uh, chief host, and I agree with um, the assessment that uh, Dr. Adebola has um, uh, made. Uh, let me even say on a lighter note that the, the, the last point she made about, you know, centralization and um, you know, um, the court system and all that. That was even an issue that was um, a very bad one uh, uh, prior to Kama 2020, in the sense that um, uh, by the nature of uh, the Federal High Court having exclusive uh, jurisdiction over matters arising or connected to, uh, um, you know, uh, the Companies and Allied Matters Act, and by extension insolvency, uh, we, we had a situation where um, even the provisions, because insolvency is a collective um, 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 approach to debt resolution, even the provisions on uh, winding up and things of that sort um, were interpreted so narrowly that it meant that um, people could um, forum shop in different other courts, the uh, state high court, the national industrial court, without, with impunity, because the Supreme Court had decided in a case that um, uh, Federal High Court only had jurisdiction uh, in relation to, for instance, uh, a receivership or a winding up, and it did not affect other cases. So uh, why I say that um, we've had an improvement because that issue has been remedied by the new legislation. Now, is has there been case law that will uh, strengthen and change the culture as at now? No but at least the framework um, has been remedied. And um, maybe through all these conversations uh, and you know, by practitioners, uh, capacity building, including with the court, uh, and not just the federal high court, uh, the, uh, you know, the state high court, the national industrial court, um, these would uh, you know, be a more robust uh, ecosystem because there are different stakeholders, critical stakeholders in that ecosystem. And if they are not carried along and you know, properly trained on this, we are still going to have gaps uh, practically even when um, the framework has been uh, dramatically uh, improved. Not perfect, but you know, uh, improved. Um, Bonale also um, you know, has said a lot, but uh, even other issues um, such as um, um, the issue of cross-border insolvency element of um, of in, uh, the practice or when you're having transactions that have cross-border elements and you're having an insolvency that is occurring. We don't have a framework as of today to deal with that. And we are in a global village as the uh, uh, chief uh, host has mentioned. Um, things um, are, you know, um, predicated on ICT, on global trade and on a um, 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 dematerialized environment. And so uh, it becomes critical that we should have the right tools for Nigeria 
uh, if we want to even attract investment, because some of these issues also impact even on the, the appetite for investment in Nigeria, because uh, investors do not just look at uh, the ease of access, but also the ease of exit. Uh, and exit insolvency is, is a, mean of, a means of exit. And so uh, those are issues. Uh, and so we, we need that level of robustness. This, we only, it took us about almost two years to have um, procedural regulations that would complement um, the substantive changes that uh, were achieved under the um, Kama 2020. And that's the fact that by April of this year, uh, the insolvency regulations that have been mentioned came on board. And like um, Doug said, they help to hold um, different stakeholders more accountable and particularly the insolvency office holders. But they also uh, put um, a greater responsibility on um, CAC to be an effective and efficient regulator. Uh, and um, it remains to be seen how all this will play out. Um, there are still a lot of challenges. I can tell you for free from an, uh, a practitioner perspective that uh, we still have challenges even in terms of understanding by, by the regulator, uh, the, their staff and all that. But it's a process that is ongoing. And um, I must say that the leadership of the Corporate Affairs Commission is quite proactive and they are willing to you know, have conversations. And they have been quite involved. Um, and um, even in terms of the regulation itself, it has a process of consultative um, collaborations with practitioners and all that. And so that's, that's uh, I will therefore say that um, in as much as uh, all is not uh, perfect, uh, we should be optimistic that with that type of um, approach, we should be able to, um, you know, inch closer to a very robust uh, and complete uh, um, uh, system. Now, there are other issues that need to be addressed. For you to have, um, a good robust insolvency uh, uh, ecosystem. You must also have a very good robust um, um, framework for um, 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 creditors' rights enforcement. You must also have a good framework for um, um, you know robust creation of securities. Uh, and um, you must also look at other issues because Nigeria, for instance, has. Um, Prevalently, it has um, MSMEs and SMEs as businesses. And some of the um, um, procedures that we have now, which uh, someone would say was modeled, another one would say was adopted, other ones would even say was copied from uh, the UK, um, are not necessarily adequate uh, to address those um, um, insolvency issues that are peculiar or the, uh, um, to the nature of these MSMEs and M SMEs. Those conversations are ongoing uh, internationally, and those are also conversations that have to be ongoing at the level of our legislature and the, the practitioners to create bespoke um, um, insolvency uh, procedures that will be more appropriate and more time, timely and more effective for um, um, many of these businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Okori. Uh, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Moderator. I would like to take the benefit of uh, 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 it, Mr. Dagana appears to have ceased. Okay, so whilst we're waiting for him, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Okay, yeah. So I was saying that uh, what's the role of the is there any relevance? Because I didn't hear anything. Are they still applicable? We didn't quite get you. Your, your line was, well, not line, but you were breaking. Okay, the SECT Act. I was asking about the SECT Act. Okay, the ISA. Yeah, does it relate any more to insolvency or because I didn't hear any mention of it? 
open market. It's the ISA that um, Oka was talking yeah. about. What's... That's uh, to those that are regulated uh, capital markets. Uh, so that's yes, what yes. we were talking about, segregation of assets and the like. Uh, those yeah. are okay. sectorial um, legislation. And if uh, I can just impute one additional thing to what Okori has said quite robustly, that we need to take a review or undertake a review of our sectorial laws to deal with the, the insolvencies in those, um, in those sectors, because Kama actually um, requires those sectors to handle the peculiarities of their problems. And so you would find that Kama expressly excludes uh, some of these sectors from the provisions of the um, procedures that it has introduced. Uh, so that is also an area to look into. Thank you. Thank you. So at this point, I'm going to really have to speed things up because we're already halfway through this program. So uh, Okore, I just need your answer, Bola. I'm not going to ask you on this one. So uh, Okore, in the past two years, how has the change impacted companies and their stakeholders? Very briefly, please. Okay, well, what I will say is that um, you can split those two years to one year because um, the law really um, formally was um, um, uh, came into force on January 1st, 2021, right? And um, it still took quite um, about six to nine months for the CAC to come back with um, even issues in relations to um, you know, um, um, registration and licensing of insolvency practitioners and, and things of that sort. And I, I, I hope we will have time to discuss as well um, some of those issues when it comes to even the practice, the profession and all the rest and, and, and how to become an insolvency practitioner and so on and so forth. Uh, in terms of change, uh, Yes, it, it has, you, you can begin to see the impact um, from the perspective of the practice. Um, some of these new procedures are beginning to um, be considered um, by different stakeholders, including uh, those that you would naturally see as not being interested, um, such as the secured creditors, uh, uh, because uh, people are beginning to see that there is many a times more value in um, a business rescue approach than a, a piecemeal um, realization of assets approach, uh, just because one is um, um, you know, a, a secured creditor. So we're seeing that and uh, we're beginning to see embracing uh, by the secured creditors and also embracing by the debtors themselves and their um, uh, managements that are in possession of some of the opportunities and options that these new pro procedures offer that they don't necessarily have to uh, litigate. And then uh, there is a, a greater culture now of, uh, you know, uh, beginning to look at insolvency practitioners, even from uh, an advisory uh, um, uh, um, paradigm where, you know, uh, when companies are having difficulties, they begin to look for advice as to how best to manage uh, those issues. So we can see that uh, some of those issues are coming up. And then you, you also notice that um, there are even other challenges that are coming uh, that are peculiar, not just to Nigeria, that uh, you could see that uh, people are beginning to think up about how to use insolvency to um, address those issues. Uh, for instance, uh, Ponzi scheme have been on the rise and um, uh, uh, people are looking at how to use insolvency uh, processes to deal with those issues, bearing in mind that uh, many a times uh, those assets uh, are not just, um, they, 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 they are, you have to trace those assets, not just from, you know, the promoters of the Ponzi scheme, but, you know, different other stakeholders. And it raises uh, various other new issues, but the change is, um, is, uh, is, uh, is on the way and um, we can begin to see some of the uh, dividends of that change. Thank you. Thank you, Okori. Thank you very much. So I think everybody here would probably agree that um, Nigerian insolvency laws has, have been modernized. The next thing we should think, you know, uh, and I'm sure many of you here are probably wondering, so, you know, how, how what, what's the implication on 
on myself as a stakeholder. So Bolanle, can you tell us how these changes to the insolvency law, uh, how the changes to the insolvency law is relevant to the secured creditors? Okay, that's, um, I think that that's the, <clears throat> The most powerful of the stakeholders that we have because they determine uh, the direction of the procedures that we have and um, the law gives them various uh, points of input so if i if i just picked one in the interest of time if i just picked one of those um, rescue procedures which is administration well in the past what happened uh, was that when the company went into default uh, for whatever reason the secured lender uh, just to use a shorthand most quite likely to be a bank would appoint a receiver the receiver goes in there and acts on behalf of the bank well what has happened is that now what is expected uh, I would let me what is expected it may not necessarily be the option that would be chosen but what is expected is that a, an insolvent is that a bank would pick, for example, administration over um, receivership, and there are several reasons why uh, that would probably be a preferred option. Now, when the bank has to understand that they're not the only ones now that can bring in this outside manager, what happens with administration is that an outside manager is brought into the company and takes over the management uh, of, of the company and looks to trade the company and then pay off the creditors. And of course, you expect that you pay your secured creditors first. But it's important that banks recognize now that they're not the only ones that can bring in an outside manager. The company itself or its directors can actually bring in an outside manager. And it is uh, one of the reasons why they have been given this power is because they're the first set of people who would know that the company is sliding into insolvency and that not only does the uh, financial risk that uh, is being mitigated but the insolvency risk for which the secured uh, creditor has taken uh, the security is likely to materialize and so it's important for the bank to understand what is going on uh, in that in the on the eve of insolvency as they call it now the an aware secured creditor would know that even if the company went into, even if the, uh, the directors or the company commenced administration, they are required to give notice to the bank and that the bank can, within the period of the notice, uh, either force the company to you know, bring on their own choice of administrator or that they can appoint uh, before the company can finish the commencement uh, process. It's also important to know that even if unsecured creditors, for example, went into the, into the court, the court still gives room for the choices of the secured creditor. And so it's important that they understand some of the dynamics uh, in the, you know, in the balance of power in that procedure. There are also factors like the fact that uh, the plan that is proposed by the practitioner cannot affect the rights of the secured creditor without the secured creditor giving consent. Again, you know, there's so many things that the secured creditor must be aware of. Now, I did mention the powers, the additional powers that have been given to the insolvency practitioner who is an administrator over that of a receiver. And so, uh, again, the secured creditor should understand the fact that an administrator can deal with assets that are subject to security, some without needing the consent of the court, for example, if they're dealing with assets that are subject to floating charges, others are requiring the consent of the court uh, if they're dealing with assets that are subject to fixed charges. And so this uh, balance of powers uh, uh, that have been introduced by the system have to be uh, well understood by secured creditors, uh, search for rescue finance and so many other things. And so it's important that everyone gets up to speed with this by undertaking you know, necessary training and engaging with the law um, adequately to ensure that they are well aware of what their rights are and where some of their previous rights may have been curtailed. Okay, uh, thank you very much. At this point, I'll... Uh... Sorry, Manuel, I just... Emmanuel, sorry, I just need just one minute for Okori. I just want to ask Okori one question and I'll hand over to you, please. Um, Okori, can you provide us with the other stakeholders affected by these changes and how they are affected? Just in one minute, then I'll give it to my boss to continue. Just one minute. 
um, well, there, 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 there are just so many stakeholders that are, um, um, you know, involved in the insolvency process, and they are all affected in different ways. Um, uh, Bonale has talked about the secured creditors, you know, and again, we need to understand that um, when a company is a going concern, the understanding of what is a secured creditor is different from uh, the understanding you would have uh, about what is a secured creditor because there is a definition of who qualifies as a secured creditor in an insolvency process. You could see the distinction she made between um, you know, floating charge holders and um, um, what we also call fixed charge holders. So the implications are different. So there are certainly uh, different implications for secured creditors uh, as we know them, broadly speaking. There are, uh, um, there are serious changes also that impact on um, some categories of, uh, um, you know, on secured creditors. Uh, and so the new law, for instance, um, promotes uh, what is called the, the concept of critical suppliers. Uh, and uh, within that context, uh, particularly in an administration, uh, the administrator is entitled to go into um, transactions with uh, critical suppliers, such as you know suppliers of uh, utility suppliers and, and things of that sort. And beyond that, because of his powers as well, actually he can identify, even though they are not specifically named, certain um, um, things to be done, and of course enter into contracts. And those become um, issues. Um, that have higher priorities. And so there, there are different protections that are offered by the new law for certain categories um, of um, transactions and or creditors. Um, the employees um, uh, are preferential creditors. Uh, it impacts on them because the new options of business rescue um, give an opportunity for, for them to be retained as opposed to be uh, laid off. Uh, which would typically happen in the uh, context of a liquidation. Um, even in the context of a receivership, uh, there are um, case law relating to uh, the power of a receiver to um, sack employees. There are also case law in relation to the more controversial issues of um, the power of a receiver to sack the directors. Um, this is not the platform of um, having those technical discussions, but those, those, those are there. And so there are many, uh, of course, the other stakeholders like the insolvency office holders, we've already mentioned that there is a regulation uh, uh, under the substantive law and the new regulation itself um, uh, require more accountability. And then you have the judiciary itself, um, what the courts can do when the courts need to take a back seat and allow insolvency office holder to drive the process and when the process will be driven by the court. So it affects uh, a lot of Thank the you. stakeholders. Thank you very much, Okore. I'm sure the audience have a lot of questions for both of you. So I'll just hand it over to my colleague, uh, Emmanuel Dangana, to I'm sure he also has some questions to ask you as well. Thank you very much. All right. Both uh, uh, to our topic. I just have a few questions, you know, and, uh, you know, in the course of your presentation, you spoke about the licen licensing procedure. So uh, why was the licensing procedure necessary? And how does one become an insolvent practitioner in Nigeria? I would ask Bolanli first, and thereafter, Okore can also speak. Bolanli. Okay. Um, well, I don't know whether I split that into two because <laughs> uh, it's quite a long one. So um, maybe I could talk about the licensing procedure and then Okori could talk about why it is necessary. That's fair. That's fine. Okay. So that I don't end up giving you guys a, uh, I don't know, one hour lecture. So um, like we have said, um, there are two sides, two main sides to the uh, insolvency framework in Nigeria. So if you're reading Kama uh, 2020, you have to read it alongside the insolvency regulations of 2022. And it is when you marry both together that you find what the licensing regime is. So in Kama, you will check uh, chapter 26, which sets out uh, the licensing regime. And then you check the 
uh, earlier parts of insolvency regulations, particularly regulation uh, 1.07 for the licensing regime. So when you look through, you find that where a person is to be appointed as an office holder, we call them an insolvency office holder, or insolvency practitioner. That means a person who is to be appointed as a, liquid, a liquidator or a provisional liquidator, uh, quite controversially also official receiver. I mean, we can argue that back and forth, but let's leave that one for now. But also the law says an official receiver or a person to be appointed into the office of a receiver, the receiver manager, an administrator, a nominee, a supervisor, all those new terms that you hear flying around the place right now, all all these are, are insolvency office uh, insolvency offices and the persons who occupy those offices are insolvency practitioners and so anyone who must occupy those offices must be licensed to practice now in order to know what the procedure is uh, we understand that there are two parts of it one is the educational and professional uh, qualifications that would be necessary. And so, uh, you know, in Nigeria, how we have both universities and we have polytechnics and the like. So everyone should be happy to hear that whether you went to a polytechnic or a university, insolvency law does not discriminate. What is necessary is that you graduate with a recognized degree uh, from any of those institutions. Uh, it is described as a relevant degree. Again, what is relevant then becomes a matter of, you know, argument. So at the very least, we know that lawyers and um, accountants are in. As to the other one, I suppose that you should show that it has some relevance to business. Uh, let's say, um, for me, you know, maybe someone goes to court and sues to say, if I studied history, who says I don't have a degree that is relevant? That, again, is a different matter. But what the law says is a relevant degree from a university or a polytechnic. And then importantly, you have a minimum of five years post-qualification experience in insolvency uh, matters. Uh, the person must also be authorized by a recognized professional body, and the NBA is one of the recognized uh, uh, professional bodies. And then the person must, in addition, be authorized to act as an insolvency practitioner by the Corporate Affairs Commission, the CAC. So how does the CAC, well, in order to get authorization to act uh, by the recognized professional body, uh, the expectation is that you would undertake the training uh, uh, the training procedure or the training process that they have. And the law actually says authorization and membership, essentially. So you would have to join uh, one of them, I think, to in order to get that authorization. Again, one would have to go to court as to, to determine whether merely obtaining the certificate and not becoming a member is enough. But I think that you have to become a member because you have to be subject to their disciplinary oversight. That is an important part of the process. And then you then need the authorization from CAC, which requires one to fill the form that has been prescribed by the regulations, uh, provide evidence of authorization from the recognized professional body, provide evidence of previous appointments uh, within insol the insolvency space, within the pre prior five years. Now, some people might say, but I'm new to the insolvency process and I don't have that necessary experience. Well, the regulations take care of that. And so they say that a person who has not been appointed into those offices, but has worked closely and with and under the tutelage of uh, someone who has been appointed into those offices would also qualify. It is necessary, however, that the person under whose tutelage they have been writes a letter to uh, advocate for them to say that, yes, they have been under their tutelage. Uh, there must be evidence of completion of an accredited course. Uh, the prescribed fee must be paid. And then there's the element that I think most professional, uh, most professionals must recognize, which is the fit and proper aspect of it. The person must be fit and proper to uh, be appointed into that office and then meet any other requirements as to education, practical training and experience. Again, there's a group that is disqualified. So the person must also ensure or demonstrate that they don't you know, fit into any of those disqualifications. That is, they are not an infant as described by our constitution. They, are not, uh, they have not been found by a competent court to be of unsound mind. They have not been found 
well, they have not, they are not an undischarged uh, bankrupt. We don't have many of those in Nigeria, as Okori said. Um, they should not be in a position of conflict. So they will not be a director of the company or an auditor of the company or have any other um, conflicts of interest, you know, that takes us back to cases like IDC versus Cooley, as you're collecting money, you know, in one way or the other, there's any monetary benefits there. Uh, a body corporate is not recognized as an insolvency practitioner and anyone that has been convicted of any offense, including or involving fraud or dishonesty or corruption you know, or disqualified under section 280 of the Insolvency Act, uh, those people would be disqualified. If I could say one sentence quickly, uh, because I did say I would yield to query on this, on why it is necessary, I think that our insolvency system is quite administrative and the linchpin of that system is the insolvency practitioner. And so historically we had this back and forth as to whether we needed a licensing procedure, but given that good regulation requires that the costs do not outweigh the benefits. Uh, in Nigeria, where we have a court system that is already full and we have a body of uh, people who have the expertise and can be professional enough to handle the matters, they have deemed it fit to handle the administration of those matters to those people. But it is uh, important, it is imperative actually, that they are properly regulated and that is why the licensing uh, process was put in place or was necessary. Uh, Okori, I'll yield to you. Oh, well, thank you, Doc. Uh, that, that was comprehensive. I'll just add a couple of things. One is the fact that um, uh, we, we need to make it clear that um, regulation and licensing of insolvency practitioner is nothing unusual anywhere in the world. Um, it's um, um, these professions are regulated for the purpose of accountability and also for the reasons earlier mentioned by Doc that um, it's a deference uh, by the court system, you know, and by other stakeholders to the fact that you, you have a, a professional that is sufficiently trained and sufficiently controlled through regulation to do what needs to be done to, you know, um, to achieve uh, an orderly resolution of the insolvency issues. Um, practically speaking, uh, from what um, Doc has said, you will deduce that um, uh, LCCI cannot be an insolvency practitioner. I just want to make it as mm -hmm. practical as possible. However, all the members of LCCI here are potentially uh, in a position to be authorized to practice. Why? Because they are uh, professionals uh, in their respective fields. I, I assume, and it is assumed that all of them have educational qualifications, right? And that uh, uh, usually they, they will probably have had that qualification, educational qualification uh, more than five years uh, 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 by now. And of course, it may be a bit more difficult to achieve uh, the fact that they may have been exposed to uh, insolvency practice, uh, but all that is required is that whether it is at the level of advisory or tutelage or working with somebody that has held the insolvency office, you are able to show that you, you are practically exposed. Uh, and so within that context, uh, even the issues regarding um, adequacy are sorted out by the fact that the regulations are such that it embeds training as, uh, as one of the essential elements of, um, you know, qualification to be authorized to practice. In other words, um, if you don't properly take an insolvency course, uh, um, and um, those are given by uh, different bodies, NBA, as uh, Dr. Uh, Bolali has mentioned, is one of them. Uh, there are others uh, that have been recognized um, uh, by CAC. If you don't have um, an insolvency course that you take, which is meant to be um, a quality assurance, uh, you will not be able to be authorized by CAC practically. CAC, usually when people just come prior to 2020, people will come and, you know, they want to register the fact that they have been appointed as receiver and manager, mm -hmm. for instance. Now, if they are to do that and they cannot show that they have been trained and are members of a recognized professional bodies, or at least have been trained uh, in an accredited course, which is required 
uh, for you to be authorized to practice. CSC would turn them back and tell them, go and do the needful before you come back. So that's, that's, that's essentially it. Now, in terms of licensing itself, um, I mean, it's, it's, once it is done, uh, CSC appoints, but CSC also has power of removal. And that takes you back to the issue of fitness and propriety and issues of, of accountability. Uh, and ethics of the profession if they are breached. And that's also part of the reason why um, the insolvency office holder or practitioner rather is um, taught to be a member of a professional body so that th there is a delegated ability for that, that professional body to call him to book when there are cases of uh, professional misconduct. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh... I see we have managed uh, our time well. Time is well spent uh, and far gone, but I just want to wrap up you know, with two more questions before we look at the chat room for uh, you know, question and answer. Um, these licenses that you are talking about, are they renewed regularly or it's like a one-off payment? is actually a one-off payment, but is renewed uh, in the sense that um, under the regulations, the CSC regulations, um, when you have um, uh, met up with the conditions that we mentioned earlier, and you submit an application to, to be appointed, or rather to be authorized to practice, you would pay um, CSC the sum of 50,000 Naira. Now the license, uh, is for a period of, um, uh, it was two years, they have extended it to three years, but it's renewable, but at no cost, at no additional cost. That's the position, yeah. Okay, and then lastly, for the members of the LCCI and attendees who would wish to become a specialists like you or who would want to be trained in insolvency practice how would you advise them to proceed okay what i would say is that as we mentioned earlier there are a few recognized professional bodies and nba is one of them brightpan is also another one and uh, um as uh, my chair had mentioned at the beginning of uh, the event uh, um, those, those are also part of the reasons for this collaboration. LCCI boasts, I'm sure, of different professionals and certainly lawyers and accountants and, uh, you know, people that are holders of MBA, uh, finance uh, degrees and so on and so forth. Um, incidentally, uh, Mr. Kusamoto is the chair of the Restructuring and Insolvency Committee and, um, and the NBSBL has um, a certification course that is done. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, one is coming up next month, and I think I would I would like to leave him to uh, provide more uh, details on that, Mr. Kusamoto. Yes, uh, Okori. Yes, I, I'll do that. But can you tell me? I, I have a question for you. Yes. As far as this training is concerned. Can you tell the audience whether this is just restricted to lawyers and accountants or everybody can actually go for this? No, no, uh, lawyers and accountants are recognized specifically, but other um, 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 professionals are also accommodated by the, um, the language of the law. Um, so long as um, they have anything that who make them to be connected. The reality is that uh, it's just like the profession of banking. You have historians, you have uh, uh, people that have read biochemistry and all the rest that end up being bankers. And somewhere along the line, they also go through a certification uh, to become professional bankers. Um, what the law looks at mainly is to have a formal education. That means that you have a certain level of intellectual ability, you know, to understand the issues, analyze problems and all the rest. And then you also have uh, a professional training that will equip you specifically for the sector uh, in which you want to go into. Incidentally, um, insolvency brings on board so many uh, skills. 
um, you'll find out that you can have a business that is in the area of agri, you know, uh, you will have a business that is in the area of fintech. You have a, a business that may be a hospital or a hotel and all the rest. And so you have different people with different skills. Uh, and of course, you, you may want to appoint an insolvency practitioner that understands um, um, a business if, if, uh, if possible. But even if that's not the case, insolvency practitioners do not operate in silos. They actually have the power to recruit technical persons, you know, uh, to be able to carry on the business and all the rest. And that is why um, the aspect of training them on the aspect of the law and on the aspect of finance and understanding, uh, you know, uh, finance, uh, accounting issues, tax issues, all these things that will come up in the process of running a business, uh, even though insolvent, uh, come to be. And if I may just jump in there. So we've talked a lot about... Um the say for example the cva that's the company voluntary arrangement and people often it, it, when you're faced with a company voluntary arrangement essentially what you need is a plan the business plan that is viable that helps restore the company to um a profitable state usually it's not your lawyer you're looking for for that you are looking for a person with business experience and so as okori has said people with sectoral experience are, are best placed to be appointed as nominees because when they undertake the training not only do they understand the procedures that they have to follow but it also means that they bring to bear that sectoral experience that they had have in order to craft uh, a plan that is most likely to succeed and restore the business uh, to profitability. So it's not limited to uh, lawyers or accountants. We actually need people that are business oriented and with that level of experience uh, to get involved in this space. And I think that the LCCI is full of them. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Bola. Like uh, Corey. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like Okori had earlier said about this um, course, of course, we have this mindset. A lot of us, uh, it's almost like if you, if you owe, you've committed a crime or something. Everybody has, I mean, at some point or the other, businesses could have challenges and then you need to sort it out. And um, this training is really to assist us to really understand the whole process and also for people who would actually like to get into it and, and make a profession out of it. So it's something that the, we, we find very, very, very important and we think it will be very useful for education and even for businesses themselves. And this is why we have put together some of the finest brains that we can find in Nigeria for this course to, to assist. And as my colleague has said, it will be um, the, the details of it will be forwarded and it is something that uh, we'll be very happy to have as many of your members joining as possible. So I know we are really, really out of time. Um, Emmanuel, I'll uh, hand, this, hand, it, hand it over to you, but I can see a question here. I can see two questions in the box. I think you can take the question. Please take the question on the chat room, please. Mr. Right, Mr. okay. So do you want me to read it out because I yeah, can? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I see a question, a question from, from Ismail. I think you could start with the, the one from um, Ol Oludare, which is when is the okay. training slated for and how can one get to register? Okay, so yeah, uh, but so when is that? The training is for the 16th to 18th of November. And um, I think the, NBA will pass on the registration um, procedure so that people can register uh, to join in. Okay, there's something from um, Angela Bam Kole and her question, the question is, is there a bulletin that gives a highlight of company that are into receivership? That's the first question. Uh, Corey, you can answer that. Secondly, uh, receivership is a bit punitive and not helping the economy when we consider the staff laid off the multiplier effect in the economy. Why should the country not consider sustainability of the company that, than receivership? So there are two questions. One is on receivership and the other one is on the bulletin. Can either of you answer that, please? 
Okay. Um, as to whether there is a bulletin that gives a highlight of a com of companies that are into receivership, I'm not aware that there is. However, um, mm -hmm. the the way um, insolvency processes are statutorily um, you know controlled, um, and so there are certain requirements uh, in terms of um, advertisements, in terms of filings. Uh, in public registry, such as the CAC. And so to an extent, um, access is available for searches to be made, uh, searches to be made in the court, searches to be made at the CAC. Uh, um, but whether there is a bulletin, no. Um, in some cases, um, the Office of uh, a Liquidator, for instance, there are certain advertisements that can be made in the official gazette which incidentally, practically speaking, is not a very, it's not a very, uh, um, what I call it, it's not a very public um, um, source of information, uh, unlike uh, in other clients. Um, advertisement are also made, but there's no bulletin uh, per se. However, it is possible that among um, some professional bodies, uh, some, some of these mechanisms can be uh, developed to, to give you know some level of information to uh, um, uh, members of the general public. Now you mentioned the fact that receivership is a bit punitive and not helping the economy, and so on and so forth. Why should the country not consider sustainability of the company of uh, rather than receivership? The country has considered that, and that's what we are saying, and that's why you have um, a reform of the law. Uh, that has led to um, some new um, insolvency procedures such, such as the CVA that we mentioned and the administration. Now, uh, as uh, uh, Bonan Lee uh, mentioned, even the existing um, uh, procedures like receivership have been touched upon, um, even um, arrangement of, and compromise as well, have also been touched upon. Now, um, there, there are more uh, obligations that are imposed on the receiver to tilt him towards have, uh, having a business rescue approach approach when he's a manager. And, uh, and it is there. In fact, there is even an interesting provision uh, that uh, under the camera, section 4524, if I'm correct, that tries to view the receiver and manager as for all intent and purpose an administrator in as much as um, Obviously, it is not, uh, technically speaking, a collective procedure uh, like um, uh, an administration. But certainly, both in terms of the substantive law um, intent, uh, at least disclosed by some of these provisions, and then regulations, uh, you could see that there is a greater uh, sustenance of rules that are, are pushing um, you know, receivers and managers uh, to be considering the business rescue case first and foremost before looking at um, the realization or liquidation case. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. I only see a comment from is Ismail Yusuf about the you know what what one needs a person is qualified to act as an insolvency practitioner, but I don't see a question there. So I think he was taking notes, but if we could help him, he could take a look at section 704 to 707 of Kama. Uh, he will see some of these issues that we are discussing there. Okay, so I don't see any other questions, but if there are other questions you have, you can always email it to us. Uh, Mr. Dangana can provide an email for you and we'll be happy to answer those questions. At this point, um, I think uh, we, are, we are done with, uh, with this presentation. And uh, Dangana, uh, hand it over to you. Well, I think the last like to, question uh, well, that just came in. Well, sorry, I, I, before I forget, I'd like to thank, especially thank everybody for attending. I know this is not a vote of thanks, but uh, on behalf of the section on business law restructuring and insolvency committee, I'd like to thank everybody Thank the LCPI and thank my colleagues, Okorie and Bolan Lee, for doing such a wonderful job. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, I see a business opportunity here. Uh, there's a training that is coming up and uh, LCCI has mm -hmm. members. And uh, Okori, yes, I'm please. sure there's, uh, there's a place for some collaboration, I believe. So I'll talk to my bosses here at the LCCI and then we'll see how we can work something out so that everybody has a buck in the pocket. You know, times are hard. Uh, <laughs> you want to restructure the pocket of LCCI? My brother, we have to restructure <laughs> the pocket so that we can keep afloat, you know. The, the uh, I must that, also... Uh, Dr. Adeoye, uh, our chair, is here. I'm sure, as he mentioned from the beginning, um, the a mantra of collaboration. I'm sure, because he's a paying is a technical um, um, uh, course and certification. And so uh, it's, it, it has a cost, but I'm sure um, if, if need be, um, I'm sure we can get some level of uh, approval to discount for members of uh, LCCI. Uh, I don't know, uh, the chairman is here. I don't want to put him on the spot, but I'm already on the spot. Okay. Uh, yes, Aoga, you are already on the spot, Mr. Chairman, sir. I'm saying the Oga Kwata Kwata of NBS. Yes, the Oga Kwata Kwata of the SBS. <laughs> Oga is already on the spot. <laughs> we, well, we, hear, also, okay. we hear you, and there will be okay. further discussions. Thank you very much. Okay. okay, thank you very much, sir, for accepting to be on the spot. I also want mm -hmm. to thank, uh, you know, uh, the ESCO. You know, these things cannot be done. It's teamwork. On our own part, the ESCO of the PPG has also helped in no small way uh, to make this day possible. I thank the secretary, Eze. Eze has jumped to another assignment. Uh, we can't thank uh, Eze enough for all the work that he's doing. And then on this note, I would like to call on the deputy Emmanuel, chairman. Sorry, of the Emmanuel. Yeah. I'm sorry, but um, there's a Mr. Famo Dimu who has asked, just the same question concerning the course. And we'd okay. like to know if um, this training would qualify them to become insolvency practitioners, this training from the 16th to the 18th, and how much it will cost. Okay, um, I'll provide that information on uh, our professional practice uh, platform when I get it from the uh, restructuring committee. I don't know if that would be adequate, and we'll also ensure that you know we we'll share the information on all our platforms within the LCCI because I believe that there is an opportunity, you know, for members to cash in on. Uh, you know, uh, we need to diversify in all that we are doing so that uh, the economy doesn't give us a, an uppercut. Uh, on this note, I would like to call on the Deputy Chairman of the Professional Practice Group, Mr. Ndaxin. And before then, uh, I, I know that the DG was, was with us. She told me she was going to stay to the... She wasn't too short that she would stay to the very end because of a prior appointment, but just for the records. Is the DG still here? And if she's still here, I'm sure she would like to make a comment because I know she's uh, she's very, she's at at home with issues around corporate governance and where we're talking about uh, insolvency. Dr. Bolanle spoke about uh, you know uh, corporate governance, so I don't know. DG, okay, I'm thank here, you. Sir. She's here. Okay, thank you, ma. Um, okay, so I'm here, and I think the conversation. I really don't think I want to add anything to the conversation because I think the um, panelists and the moderator, they've done a very good job. I think the only thing to say um, is that with corporate governance, um, it, it's a way to prevent insolvency. So if we can perhaps create more awareness about good corporate governance and let businesses understand the benefits um, of, good of having the corporate governance structures in place, even if you're a small business, understand um, the extent of governance that you need to put in place to mitigate um, your business going down. Um, that will be helpful in the long run so that businesses are kind of 
encouraged to be a bit more sustainable than just let's wait for them to die and then we'll bury them. And so I, I think that's, the, for me, that's the way I want to look at it because I'm a public governance person. I'm not a, a lawyer and I don't deal in, in insolvency. I don't bury companies. I make sure companies are alive <laughs> and sustainable. So it's just to strengthen those companies and um, perhaps have a, a more uh, active way to prevent insolvency. For me, that's what I'll add to the conversation. But thank you very much for the um, panelists. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you for everybody on um, the moderator. Thank you for your help. Madam, madam, sorry, please. I just want to make a very poignant point you've just made there when you said you don't bury companies. As a matter <laughs> of fact, we want to save companies. That's why we're here. Not to yeah. bury companies, but to rescue them. So, so we have the same objective, that is good. <laughs> if I, if I may you, provide Mr. further comf comfort to uh, Dr. Almona, uh, aside from what the chairman has said, which is a perception issues that, like we said, the law is changing, and uh, but it, it has to follow suit. But uh, incidentally, um, the, the issues, the, the, the relationship between corporate governance and uh, uh, restructuring, is is critical actually um, some of these are issues when you look at the causes of um, business failures corporate governance is one of the uh, major causes incidentally i know that um, i think i recall that at the level of the uh, um, nbsbl um, um, restructuring committee there is one um, um, program that is coming up that is supposed to actually explore this particular um, um, area of topic and how you know a corporate governance uh, uh, is used as a tool uh, for restructuring. And so I, I'm sure that it will be an interesting thing and that we'll, we'll make sure that we also make uh, um, the information available for those that are interested in LCCI to, uh, to listen to the, uh, to the program. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Curry. You're welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Almona. And on this note, I'd like to call on the deputy chairman of the professional practice group, Mr. Micah Ndaksen, to give us the closing remarks. Mr. Ndaksen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's uh, always very interesting to uh, hear you speak. You're always looking for opportunities for members. Uh, that's quite appreciated. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Ayo, the moderator, you've done a, a great job. This is just a closing remark. Uh, Dr. Bolale, as well as uh, um, Corey, you've done a great job. As uh, Ayo said, actually, the whole idea was uh, to give us an understanding of all the, the whole process, uh, then which will be useful to our businesses. And then, of course, for people who want to get involved in all of this. As we're talking, actually, the uh, thought came to me, uh, it's, it's so true that the borrower is servant to the lender. And you see, if borrowers, companies, corporations realize this, then they will be uh, uh, very serious in managing other people's money. Uh, there's uh, some kind of irresponsibility in the system, and I hope that the businesses represented here will uh, give it our uh, best shots to make sure that we handle uh, credits very responsibly. There are all kinds of issues that I've been mentioned. Um, I don't want to repeat any of them again, but we have to just remember the servant. I mean, the borrower is always servant to the lender. And whenever I attend the situation, a kind of course like this, I uh, always want to relate the course to my past. What is the need for us? I hope every one of us has taken one thing concerning what is the need for me? You know, have you recognized a principle that you can use? And then you relate it to your situations. All right, uh, how do you connect? How do, what you are doing right now, your business is how do you connect that uh, with what you've all had? Because it's not, uh, it's a waste of time to first start come and listen and don't do anything about it. Then we have to uh, assimilate. How do we inc inc incorporate all these insights and concepts uh, into our behavior? You know, we have to have responsible behaviors in managing other people's money. Finally, we have to apply. You know, all of these things are worthless if we don't apply them. You know, this is faith without uh, actions, it's a dead thing. And as uh, I will end with Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee once gave a quotation. I mean, well, he said something. He said, knowing is not enough, we must apply. 
And then willing is not enough either. We must do. So all we've heard, we have to carry all this to our businesses to make things happen. So again, we appreciate the presentation. We have the best friends here and they've done justice to the uh, topic of insolvency. And uh, now we're so very grateful for what you've done. And you know, every good thing has to come to an end. And uh, thank you, we don't have to close. So I hand over to uh, the Director General for the, uh, uh, the closing remarks and then the vote of thanks. Thank you. Yeah, he's always inspiring us with, you know, quotable quotes. Today is Bruce Lee. <laughs> honestly, so, honestly uh, I felt like doing, yeah, you know, the Chinese uh, something. It was very nice. <laughs> yeah, so thank you very uh, much. Sir. I think, uh, and on that note, you know, uh, I think we have come to the end of today's uh, session. Uh, we thank everyone. You know, it's not really easy on a working day to have, you know, professionals take two, about two hours. It's almost uh, getting to two hours now, you know. But it's been, for me, I think I've learned a lot and I'm, I'm grateful to LCCI. I'm grateful to the MBA, SBL and the restructuring committee. Thank you very much, Dr. Bolanle. Thank you, uh, Okore. Thank you, Ayo. And uh, I pray that you guys have, you know, a good day. It's still uh, not 12 o'clock, so we can still achieve something today. And I'll make sure that we post all the relevant information on the upcoming training, you know, to all our platforms so that members can take benefit out of it. Thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. So bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.